In this news roundup of the week on 24th of February 2023, the world marks the one year anniversary of the start of the Ukraine war with big speeches on all sides saying nothing particularly new. China puts itself forward as a neutral peace broker in ways that may please neither Russia nor America. The US Supreme Court is offered the chance to break the internet with a single decision, but looks like declining the offer. And in this week's short thought, the so-called scientists arguing for climate-focused rationing illustrate an important lesson for us all. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. As will have escaped nobody's notice, today, the day this video is published, is the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This time last year, Russia put a couple of weeks where they had been saying, of course we're not going to invade Ukraine. They put that behind them and they sent in the tanks. The West immediately shifted into the expectation that it was all over bar the shooting and it offered Zelensky an escape route while the world prepared for a Ukraine where guerrilla resistance against an occupying force would become the focus of attention. And Ukraine, of course, was not minded to play that role. The West quickly adapted as it became more and more clear that the Russians had miscalculated the certainty of short-term success. And so on and so on. And now here we are. The anniversary was marked by Putin making his long-delayed State of the Empire address and by President Biden visiting Ukraine's President Zelensky in Kiev before making a speech in Poland. One year in, there are a number of things that we haven't seen. First, in spite of a major speech by Putin that was billed in advance as being a significant moment, there is no sign of movement one way or the other from Russia. It had been thought that Putin might use the speech to lay out new conflict objectives, either to allow him to visualise a way to an off-ramp to victory by escalation. The latter might have involved, for instance, moving the status of a conflict from special operation to actually declaring war and maybe announcing a new mobilisation. Well, he did none of those things. Indeed, to the frustration of the pro-war military bloggers on his own side, such as Igor Gherkin, he did none of that. He didn't acknowledge that mistakes had been made. It was a rehearsal of exactly the same messages we'd heard for the last year, with the aggressive tone of rhetoric ramped up in lieu of any substance. The West, he said, started the war, in spite of the fact that it really didn't, Ukraine was being run by Nazis, in spite of the fact that it really wasn't. That's all the stuff that you expect. But other than pulling from the new START nuclear process, there was nothing to live up to the speech's advance billing. But to be fair, if Putin was simply singing a rehash of his greatest hits, so too was President Biden. The main difference was that by startling some, by daring to go in person to Kyiv, something that many other leaders have done, but the first time in many decades that a US president has gone into a war zone that wasn't actively controlled by the US military, he'd been able to make a symbolic gesture of courage and commitment. America's in it for as long as it takes, he declared to the world. The world, of course, knows that what this really means is for as long as Joe Biden is president. Should he, or at least his party's alternative candidate, lose in 2024 to a Trump or a DeSantis, it's a lot more uncertain what trajectory American's foreign policy would take. But that's nearly two years from now, which is twice as long as the war has lasted to date, so you would think something should change during that time, one way or the other. It's not entirely clear what that change will be. The new speechifying didn't deliver anything like a realistic vision for what either side's goals in the conflict will now be. Putin says that the West wants, and has always wanted, to eradicate Russia completely. Well, it clearly doesn't although people close to Putin insist that his belief that it does is completely sincerely held. The problem is more that NATO doesn't know what it wants to achieve in terms of its strategy here. Insisting that the end point is wholly up to Ukraine seems to be as much about avoiding having to work out specifically what NATO's interest should be in how a post-Ukraine war pans out. 
Instead, all the energy goes into debating what weapon systems should or should not be sent to Ukraine, which is a weirdly reactive, strategy-free approach you wouldn't expect to result in anything particularly good. Meanwhile, we actually got one interesting new intervention this week, which was an estimate from Western officials of Ukrainian war losses. As I've mentioned here a number of times, Western agencies and mainstream media outlets very rarely talk about Ukrainian losses, not wanting to give useful information to Russia. But this week, we heard that officials estimate that Ukraine's military has suffered at least 100,000 casualties since this time last year. This was compared, according to the same sources, with 200,000 Russians that they estimated to have been killed. They said Ukraine's lower death rate was significantly because the medical services available to the injured, unlike Russia, since it is operating on enemy territory. The suggestion is that Ukraine's death to wounded ratio is therefore significantly lower, over 10 wounded to 1 dead versus Russia's 3 to 1. One official was quoted as saying, We can't escape the fact that Ukrainians have been taking casualties at a level which would be unsustainable for many countries. So, as the gameplay from Putin seems to be to settle in for the long run, and the West has no appetite for decisive action to upset that equation, then the question I raised last time, one of which side runs out of resources and willpower first, seems confirmed as the decisive factor for the Ukraine war. Meanwhile, not all on the Russian side have been happily marking the anniversary and doubling down. Yevgeny Prigozhin, who a couple of years ago was trying to sue the founder of Bellingcat for saying that Prigozhin was the head of a Wagner group, is now, of course, proudly standing up as uh, the head of a Wagner group, standing up and complaining that the Russian military's attempt to reassert its role has meant that his fighters are being starved of ammunition, this is leading to heavier casualties than would otherwise be the case. So in several broadsides aimed at the authorities this week, he said that the pretense that Wagner's victories were achieved by the major Russian army instead led to ammunition being diverted to the mythical fighters rather than the real ones. He posted a picture of a number of dead fighters saying that this was simply those that had died that day and the numbers would have been five times less if Wagner had been getting the ammunition that they were asking for. The US White House has estimated that Wagner Group has suffered 30,000 casualties since the invasion, 90% of those since December having been convicts recruited by Wagner from Russian prisons. Now, I would take all casualty figures here with a pinch of salt. None of them may sound unfeasible, they may be broadly correct, but massaging such figures is a routine aspect of warfare I would keep an open mind. Except for the obvious fact that this is universally a horrible process that is costing many people their lives. We should join together at least in wishing that we not be marking a grim second anniversary this time next year. We should also be hoping that things don't escalate in ways that we're currently only getting hints of. So, for instance, Russian spy ships have been spotted in the North Sea, apparently scouting out potential sabotage targets of Western infrastructure. Belgium's Justice Minister, Vincent van Quickenborn, said that suspect movements had been seen close to wind turbines, telecommunication cables and gas pipelines. On Monday this week, Dutch intelligence agencies produced a report saying that Russia is covertly mapping critical infrastructure. Maybe that's just testament to Putin's Western paranoia. He really does believe that NATO is going to be attacking Russia itself in the near future, so he's laying plans on how to respond should that happen. And in the absence of such an attack, those preparations will stay purely on paper. But... Given everything that's happened, you have to hold in mind that identifying target infrastructure is a first step to developing the capacity to actually take it out. However, there are other players, and the less high-profile but actually more interesting aspect of this week has been the role of China. Putin received a visit from the Chinese top diplomat Wang Yi, which was part of the process of paving the way to a planned visit by Xi Jinping himself. But although the public words were all about the deepening relationship of support between Russia and China, 
There are a number of signs to think it's not such a straightforward situation. And we know, because Putin himself referred to it in public at the time, that China has been critical of Russia's actions in Ukraine. Wang Yi's visit was, according to anonymous Chinese sources quoted by the Financial Times, based on a more complex game. According to those sources, China is working on repairing its image in the West, an argument that's congruent with the reports of the dismay in Beijing at the spy balloon incident. The argument is that by showing its efforts to persuade Russia to adopt a political settlement, it may gain renewed favour, particularly with European trade partners. One of the easiest parts of this is to show that Beijing stands steadfastly against the use of nuclear weapons. And that's easy, because to all appearances, Putin himself has, having considered the question, counted out the use of nuclear weapons based on the absence of any scenario where it would actually benefit Moscow to do so. Wang Yi's visit came in advance of Beijing releasing a position paper on today, the day of the anniversary, and it was said that it was specifically to let Putin know that not every detail contained within the paper was going to make him happy. The paper was foreshadowed by China's position in the United Nations debate on Ukraine the day before, where it called for a ceasefire, dialogue, security guarantees for Russia, protection of civilians and the upholding of territorial integrity, which might have been one of the bits Putin wouldn't have liked. According to one anonymous Chinese official, the Xi Jinping visit is predicated on a positive response from Russia to China's call for dialogue and negotiations. And the FT added this, Beijing is worried that without such confirmation, Putin could use a Xi visit simply to bolster his own standing. I'm sure the thought never crossed his mind. But it's a fascinating comment, very revealing of the cold calculations that are going on in each of the different capitals. Moscow may not have much of an idea of how this finishes. The West might well be utterly clueless as to what its objectives are. But you have to think that the Chinese leadership seem to have developed a reasonably clear idea of how they will seek advantage through how they play their hand over the coming period. Now, it doesn't have a free hand if Putin doesn't play ball and he's so dug into his position, that's a strong possibility, China won't feel it can just jettison its public support of Russia per se. Maybe that's why America believes that China may be gearing up to sell military drones to Russia, breaking its practice over the last year of providing no lethal aid. If US intelligence is right about that, it would apparently cut right across China's statement released today, which makes it a more confusing picture to interpret. But China is nevertheless gearing up to begin playing a part as a more active participant than it previously did, as an aspiring world leader would expect to do. Now that leaves the question of how others respond. If you were in NATO, you'd be weighing up the possibility that China's voice would actually be influential with Putin, unlike their own, versus America's likely concern that China's intent is to use the situation to project itself into the role of international neutral middleman and peace broker. The early indications are that the West is responding with negativity. EU President Ursula von der Leyen said today that China had already taken sides with Russia. NATO head Jens Stoltenberg suggested that China didn't have much credibility in its attempted intervention given that it hadn't condemned the invasion at the start. Of course, whether the West's lack of support for China's position weakens its move or actually conversely strengthens it, at least with a Russian audience, remains to be seen. The war on the ground may not change much over the next few months. The dynamics around the war are about to change in ways we might not have expected. Now, in the UK, companies such as Signal, who provide end-to-end -end encryption messaging services, suggest that they might stop providing services to the UK if current proposal to break that encryption in the name of protecting the victims of abuse go through. The government, they said, was trying to have their cake and eat it, to believe you could have encryption for all the nice people, but not for the bad people. In fact, if you break encryption for the bad people, de facto, you break it for everyone. 
But that's not even the most important case this week, where people who patently don't understand the internet are being asked to frame and pass laws or make rulings that could fundamentally change the nature of the internet. That would be the US Supreme Court case that was heard this week between Google and Gonzalez. That was a case where nine not particularly tech-savvy judges are being asked to rule in a way that many commentators had judged to be a move that would potentially end the nature of the internet as we know it. At the centre of the case, along with the related case of Tamney versus Twitter, is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This is the section that says that tech platforms are not liable for what people post on those platforms, specifically this, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. The left have frequently attacked this protection, saying that it enables the tech giants to permit the spread of what they describe as hate speech and extremist content. It should be said that there are existing exceptions to the protection for illegal sex trafficking, violations of federal criminal law or copyright violations. All of those bring a higher degree of platform liability to find and remove them. But in spite of those exceptions, such companies are not being held to account, the left says, for the real-world harm that such content creates whilst they earn advertising revenue from its dissemination, which is why they don't want to tackle it. But for many others, even if they see some merit in the complaint, platforms such as YouTube, Twitter and Facebook would become completely unviable without that protection and society would lose a lot more than it gained, particularly in free speech. Whatever censorship you think exists right now, for example on YouTube, would pale in comparison if a company was to be held legal accountable for every single user's content. Controls would have to be tightened so much in order to remove any risk, it would be almost impossible to have any sort of free discussion about current affairs. So paranoid would the algorithm have to be. The Supreme Court case comes from the family of Noemi Gonzalez, who was killed in the 2015 ISIS attack in France. The lawyers argued that YouTube's algorithm recommendations violated a US anti-terrorism law, actively assisting in the radicalisation of susceptible viewers of ISIS content. The argument wasn't that YouTube was liable because it hosted the content, because that's covered by section 230, but that because its algorithm actively found an audience for the videos, those who are interested in ISIS in other words, it moved from therefore being a content host to a de facto content booster. That would make any system, and all the platforms obviously use a recommendation system of some kind, otherwise no one would ever discover any content via them, would make it liable to criminal penalty. And that would de facto make the social media model unsustainable as it currently exists, without an obvious new model that would avoid the liability, say for one with extreme restrictions on the type of content anyone's allowed to post. And note that the plaintiffs in the Supreme Court case had no evidence to suggest that the actual Paris terrorists had seen YouTube's algorithmic suggestions and had been influenced by them. Just that they could have been. And this was key to moving it from a straight content hosting case, clearly protected by Section 230, to a content boosting one, on the hope that maybe it would be seen differently. You'd still think you'd need a stronger degree of proof, you would think. For all the fears that various agencies expressed about the potential for this case to suddenly wind up breaking the internet, it doesn't seem that the Supreme Court justices on either side of the equation were overly tempted to. The justices were reported by the Wall Street Journal to have been sceptical in the face of arguments that YouTube should be responsible for videos recommended by its algorithm. Various organisations had submitted briefs for the case, including Yelp, Reddit, Microsoft, Craigslist, Twitter and Facebook, and it seems as though their arguments had been persuasive, at least to some degree. Final decisions will come from the court before July, so we won't know for sure until then, but for now you can derive whatever comfort, or alternatively alarm, that you would wish from the fact that the justices clearly admitted they had no idea when it came to the detail of this case. 
At one point, Justice Alito said, I'm afraid I'm completely confused by whatever argument you're making at the present time, during a discussion about YouTube thumbnails. Justice Brown Jackson likewise admitted to being thoroughly confused. Justice Kagan was led to observe, these are not like the nine greatest experts on the internet, an admirable sense of self-awareness, if nothing else. Not one you find in many people. And speaking of which... Half of the viral political stories you see on YouTube and particularly on Twitter are made up of various forms of what is often described as nutpicking. In other words, someone relatively random says a really stupid thing on behalf of one side or the other of the culture wars. They hand a massive gift to the other side to point to what they said and use it to bolster the support of their own base. Now, I try not to do that here if I can help it. Yet another reason probably why the subs are so low. I won't claim to have never given in to the temptation because sometimes the nuts highlight a tendency that exists, even if it is rarely so blatant. This week, a couple of nuts published a paper calling for World War II style rationing in the name of climate change. If you'd wrapped it in a bow, you couldn't have made it a better present for the nut pickers on the other side. The people going on about Nazi tyranny of 15-minute cities are completely in a different world, but they are given credence by nuts like this, who are genuinely arguing for the spirit of that tyranny. I mean, genuinely, I think, without realising that's what they're doing, because they are obviously clueless about how politics works in the real world. Their argument was that somebody needs to be persuading everyone, including the electorate, of the moral virtue for rationing for the climate. Except that no electorate anywhere is going to vote for that, no political party anywhere is going to advocate it, no technocratic leader, however deluded, is recommending it. When I say that in order to change the world you have to understand how it really is, not how you'd like it to be, it's arguments like this that come into play. Rationing is a short-term response to a universally accepted emergency that short-term restricts the availability of essentials. That's something we've seen before and obviously it makes sense. Rationing is a political preference because you've decided that a long-term problem should be described in the same way and therefore even though resources are currently fully abundant that people should be prepared to accept real hardship because you say so. That has not been tested in the real world and I think it's reasonably predictable how it would go if you tried. The only substance of this ridiculous paper in the real world is that people who fear such a sentiment, believing that somehow they've gained a lot more traction than they genuinely have, will use it to give credence to those fears. Having a discussion about what should be done, how and when, then becomes that much more difficult. So here's the thing. In your political discourse, do not try to be a nut picker. In this case, these so-called scientists are not remotely representative of the mainstream scientific community, nor indeed the political community that believes climate change is a problem we have to address. But even more important than that, make sure you don't actually become one of the nuts. Sometimes people say the value of putting out radical ideas is that you will push the Overton window of what will be considered to be acceptable. But that's assuming that what you're putting forward could actually ever be a positive contribution. Otherwise, you're just making the discussion space polluted with nonsense. If your big political idea requires people to be how you wish they were rather than how history and all other evidence suggests they actually are, then you're in danger of taking exactly that role. It brings us back to the same point over and over again. Ideology is not your friend. It encourages you to see the world through a distorting prism. Understanding the world as it really is, is something you need to do if you have to have a hope of changing it for the better. All right. My thanks as always to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Without them, I could not create these videos. You may have noticed that I have been struggling to keep up the quantity of videos recently because of the amount of additional work I've had to do just to pay a few bills. 
I'm hoping that will resolve at some point in the not too distant future. For now, the support of those Patreons is absolutely key. If you would like to add your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.